So I'm going to be bringing the word to you today. And the word that God gave me was that foundations are tested first. And um, I do want you to know that today marks uh, kind of a special moment for me as well. Because uh, for those of you that know, I lost my father in February. And this is the first time actually I've preached since he passed away. And the reason it's so unique and important to me is because one thing my dad, he was my biggest cheerleader. He was always the one that when I told him I was going to be speaking, he was always letting me know. He was praying for me. He would always give me words of encouragement. I know he's still doing that even though I can't hear him personally, but he is greatly missed. And um, so it's big shoes to fill, but you know, I thank God for all that dad instilled in me and all that he poured into me. So I want to um, read from the book of Luke. And I want to read in chapter 6, starting with verses 43. Now those of you that <clears throat> know me know that I love the Amplified Bible. So I'm going to be reading from the Amplified today. And I'm going to talk about why would we build our house without a firm foundation. In verse 43 it says, For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known and identified by its own fruit. For figs are not picked from thorn bushes, nor is a cluster of grapes picked from a briar bush. The intrinsically good man produces what is good and honorable and moral out of the good treasure stored in his heart. And the intrinsically evil man produces what is wicked and depraved out of the evil in his heart, for his mouth speaks from the overflow of his heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not practice what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and listens to my words and obeys them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man who builds his house, who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house, and yet could not shake it because it had been securely built and founded on the rock. But the one who has merely heard and has not practiced what I say is like a foolish man who built a house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. You know, the scripture says, no good tree which produces bad fruit and no bad tree which produces good fruit. There, every tree, every one of us, if you take and look at us as a tree, we are known by our fruits. Imagine if you were able to physically look at a tree and see that all of the bad that had been poured into it was growing on that tree because it was representing all of the junk. Imagine if you could actually see that with your eyes and what your life or my life is producing. And you know, when we recognize that we have unhealthy things in our life and we wonder why these things start to come out, it's because that It's what you pour in that's going to come out. Amen? It's what you pour in here in your mind and in your heart that is what's going to come out on your lips and what's going to come out in your behavior. So when you have things like bitter thinking or maybe perhaps you have had improper uh, mirror imaging from parents or from leaders and people around you who have shown you the wrong way or perhaps you're one of those who's been told all of your life that you would never amount to anything, that you would never grow up and be able to do anything worthwhile, that you were no good, that 
You could do nothing right. That you are worthless. You see, you, the, the stats say that the more you hear that, and the more it's poured into you, the more you begin to believe that, and the more you begin to believe that, the more you begin to live it. Satan loves reinforcing this by reminding us constantly in our minds of all the things that we have had in our past or all the things that perhaps are negative and it begins to show up on the outside. So it is a proven fact that once we've heard that, then Satan comes along and he just keeps grinding it in a bit deeper because he wants us to focus on just that. So how can we change that so that we can have the firm foundation? Well, the good news I want to tell you is you can change that. Amen? Come on, say, I can change that. You can change it by the renewing of your mind with the Word of God. The Scripture says in Romans 12, verses 2, don't be conformed to this world and its customs and values. Focus on God's values and His ethical attitudes. And word is then it will change you. It won't be instant, but it will change you. We have to get that word of God in us. So it's it's like, you know, I I think we've talked often about, you know, those of us, I, I wouldn't say I'm no, not the healthiest person here. I wouldn't say that I always do the right thing and eat the right thing. But you know as well as I do, you eat junk, that's what your body is going to produce. Amen? When we don't eat the right thing and then it causes us to have other things go wrong with us, it's because of what we're pouring into our bodies. When we watch the wrong things, we pour that into our mind and then we wonder why do we have corrupt thoughts or why do we think about things that we know we shouldn't be thinking about because it's what we pour in on the inside of us. So how much influence does our desires have on our lives? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that we need to let God's desires be the one that become our desires. You know, I hear a lot of people say to me, well, the the Bible says that He will give me the desires of my heart. He will. But it's when you have His desires. It's not just like, you know, you roll up, oh, I think I'll have that because God said I could have the desires of my heart. So I'd like a, you know, I'd like a limo or I'd like a nice big truck or I'd like a big, nice uh, four bedroom home. I don't know. I'd like to have a million dollars in the bank. How many would you like to have a million dollars or a million pounds, whatever? How many would you like to have some money in the bank? But what we have to remember is when we focus on our desires, that's not what God desires for us. So when he says he will give us the desires of our heart, it's because that we have turned ourselves over to him so that our desires no longer become our desires, but his desires become our desires. And then he says he will give us those desires because they're not ours personally, but it's what he has put on the inside of us. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I love this whole chapter. And I'm going to start in uh, verses 1. And I want you to see how that when Paul was here planting the seed, like many other pastors and preachers, he came along and he planted the seed. And he planted that in places where, you know, that there wasn't even the name of Jesus heard. And so then comes along the others and they would water those seeds behind him. There are many of us that we plant seeds in people. But then what happens is someone comes along behind us and they sow and water and continue to water those leaves. I I kind of liken that to, you know, you hear pastors and preachers up here preaching the word. And then others come along, like maybe your life group leaders or your team leaders and those around you, your fellow Christians or mentors. And they begin to water those seeds like Apollo did for Paul. Now Paul founded the church and then Apollo built on that. So always remembering that 
our growth comes from God and that all of us as we continue to grow in Him, what I have is not just what I was able to obtain on my own. It's because when I spend that time on the foundation to grow in Him, that's when I begin to see my growth through God. And so that I may not take any credit, I sow that into others and then others come along and water that. Why? Because not to give anybody credit, but to recognize that it's God alone that brings the growth in us. But we need His Word to be able to do that. Go on down to verses 6. Through 9 in chapter 3. It's so amazing how that. When Paul is here. He says in verse 6. I planted. Apollos watered. But God. Caused the growth. Neither is the one who plants. Nor the one who waters anything. But only God causes the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Working towards the same purpose. But each will receive his own reward according to his labor. Always remembering that we don't get the glory and praise. The glory and praise is for God. That it's not about what we've done. It's about us taking our part and pouring in to others. So then when we go on down and we read about verses 10 through 17 we begin to see where he talks about that the foundation of all of us is Christ, or at least it should be. Amen? A building is only as solid as its foundation. Even when you put beautiful materials on the inside of the house, it can quickly rot if you do not have a firm foundation. So the question as I bring the word to you today is, are you building on him? Or are you building on a faulty foundation such as wealth, security, success, or fame? Is that what your focus is? Or is your focus actually the Word of God and what He wants for you? Are we building up others so that they can survive without us? You know, this is is really an important key. Because we're not trying to raise up people to where that they're all attached to us and they can't make it without us. I remember, you know, when I was growing up that uh, those who pastored a church, it was always the pastor that had to go and pray for everybody. It was always the pastor who had to go to the hospital and visit the sick. Whenever somebody needed something, it was always the pastor that had to go. I don't believe God ever intended it to be that way. I think it was traditions that taught us to be like that. But ultimately, what God wanted us to do was to be able to learn that when we teach and train and raise up others so that they also can go and lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. That we can also go and preach the word to them and they would receive freedom. Why? Because it's the word on the inside of us. Can you say amen to that? Because what I'm telling you today is it's not just down to me. It's down to all of us that as we grow the kingdom, we are not trying to grow people who become a attachments to us but people who can then go out and preach the word and teach the word and share about him and then they will receive their victory amen so are we building up others to have a strong foundation of survival you know with my dad I think about you know people see see you and they think oh she's doing fine she is doing fine I am doing fine but on the inside there are days when yes I do wake up and I miss him terribly and I want to see my dad and I want to talk to him but I'll tell you what I am grateful for my dad raised me up to be strong independent and to rely on God's word my dad taught me that when I needed something I needed to learn to go to him in prayer So when I receive that from him and I think about the times when I might be sad or I might feeling down, I think about the times when dad would say, remember, it's not about me and what I know. It's about what you know in the word as well. You know, we would, as much as I would love for all of my kids and grandkids and all the people that I know, I'd love to be able to just drag them along to heaven with me. But we can't do that. But what we can do is we can continue to pour the word on the inside of them and push them out there and keep 
keep telling them that they can make it, that they can get saved, that they can be healed. Why? Because that's what we are meant to do, to raise them up, to survive, hallelujah, without us. The spiritual man will never understand the natural man, nor vice versa. You see, a decisions that are made by a spiritual man makes no sense to someone who is not a Christian. A non-spiritual man will try to discern things with his head and with his mind. But we, as the spiritual man, discern with our spirits. So there's things that do not make sense. And you see, you know, when we, when we don't really serve God and we don't understand the things of the Spirit, we tend to always want to weigh up things about how we think or in our intellect. But I want you to know that the spiritual man looks upon the heart It does not look up on the head. It's not really what you know. It's who you know. You know, I know lots of people, you know, that might come up to me and they might say, oh, yeah, I I know why now. I know her. Lots of people can know you, but then they need to know you. Do you understand what I mean? Lots of people know you. They know what you're like. They might have seen you. They might know about you. But the only way people can really know you is when they know how, what do you do when you're faced with circumstances? What are the things that, how do they see you practice in living? And how, are the, how do they know you when they walk alongside you? So when we say that we know God... To know Him is to love Him. And to know Him is to understand Him through the Spirit and recognize that this mind will never be able to comprehend the spiritual things of God. But we all have the opportunity that we can respond and know Him with our spirit. Because remember, our spirit on the inside perceives and sees things that the natural man would never be able to do. We often depend way too much on how we feel what we see, what we understand. And Satan's job is to lie to us, to get us to believe and choose to believe all of those things that may not be true. But what I can say to you is, how does your heart, how does your heart line up with this? The truth is that we as spiritual people are hard to really understand mentally. It just doesn't make sense. We live by discernment. We go by what we know. Look in verses 2 and 3 again there in in Corinthians. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Even now you are still not ready. You are still worldly and controlled by ordinary impulses, the sinful capacity. For as long as there is jealousy and strife and discord among you, are you not unspiritual and are you not walking like ordinary men, unchanged by faith? And when it goes on, it says, For when one of you says, I am a disciple of Paul, and another, I am a disciple of Apollos, are you not proving yourselves unchanged, just ordinary people? For when what then is Apollos and what is Paul? It's just servants whom you believed in Christ, even as the Lord appointed to each his task. And then that's when it goes on to say that as we plant, and then that seed begins to get watered. You know, people want to build their lives on money, education, job titles, possessions. But that's not really what it's about. It's about building on the Word of God that we might have a firm foundation that when we are tested, it will never be shaken because we know that we have a God whom we can trust and whom will rescue us when we need it. 2 Timothy 2 verses 19. Never shaken. His foundation is sure and secure. Others might come along and they might try to dilute with their lies or they might try to tell us that it's like this or like that. But what we do know is that we can trust God in His Word. And when it says here that nevertheless, if you'll put that back up a minute please, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God which He has laid, come on say that with me, which He has laid, stand sure and unshaken despite attacks, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord stand apart from wickedness and withdraw 
from wrongdoing. I've seen countless miracles that have no explanation to the natural man. Why? Because you can't perceive it with the natural mind. You can only perceive it with what you know in the spirit. Because God doesn't operate that way. He doesn't operate with the way that we typically might think that things are. I know that it's in my dad's book. But one of the stories that just comes to me right now that meant so much to me when I was growing up. We were in the country of Colombia. Some of you that have the book may remember reading this story. A woman who had come on a team and was they were out door-to-door witnessing. And we had translators that we put with each one of them. We were in uh, a place outside of Cartagena in Colombia. And we were there going from street to street. And we couldn't send this one young lady out because we didn't have enough translators. I remember she told my dad, I flew all the way from America here to witness. And I'm not going home just empty-handed knowing that I couldn't go out and do that because there's not a translator. And he said, but there's nothing I can do. I don't have anybody that I can send with you. And she said, just let me go up and down at least one street on my own. And he said, what are you going to do? You can't speak the language. And we're in a village of nothing but fishermen. They won't know what you're talking about. She said, let me go anyway. So he told her to stay on the one street where we had uh, our main base that we were working from. And I remember that after a while, Dad suddenly said, oh my goodness, I forgot. We let her go out. And I, I said I would check on her. And he goes up the road and he finds her with nine fishermen standing in front of her. And he said he walked up behind her. And she was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in English. And here's these older gentlemen all standing with fishing nets hanging over their shoulders. None of them had probably even ever heard the English language. And she started just saying, If you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, won't you just fall down on your knees? And call out to him and ask him to forgive you of your sins. And he will save you. And my dad said he watched nine fishermen fall down on their knees. And raise their hands and give their hearts to the Lord in Spanish. That doesn't make sense. It makes no sense at all. And you know, when people would come to dad, they would say to him, you know, the usual, because the, the, the carnal mind wants to know, do you think they understood in Spanish or do you think they understood in English? Do you think she was translated? He said, I don't know and I don't care. I just know that they understood. And they understood enough to give their hearts to the Lord. And it was funny because when she turned around and she saw my dad standing there, she said, please help me. And he said, you don't need my help. Because the Holy Spirit's already done that for you. So I say to you this. When you get excited about the Word and you want your foundation, your life built upon Him. There is no limit to what God will do. But you have to be willing to empty yourself of all the self control all the self uh, things that you want in life. And you have to empty it and say to Him, Lord God, I want my life built on you because I want you to use me. I want to know that everything I do is all about bringing you glory and praise. You see, when you go back, and I'm, I won't go back to read it again, but I just want to paraphrase. When you go back to Luke 6.45, our, spirit, our speech and our actions reveal our true underlying beliefs and attitudes and motivations. Whatever is in your heart comes out in your speech and in your behavior. Sometimes we want to cut corners when we build our foundation, maybe due to time, or maybe it's a lot of hard work. But in the long term, I can tell you this, it'll cost you more money and it'll cost you more time. Obeying God means that you need to build on that strong foundation so that when the storms come, you can sustain the storm. You see... When everything is calm and when it's good, you're good. Yeah, everything's fine. Our foundations don't seem to matter because we're rolling along and everything is sweet. 
But then suddenly, the crisis comes. And our foundations get tested first. So I'm going to read a scripture because there's something I want us to do today. I didn't intend on preaching very long because I wanted to go I want you to go to Matthew chapter 7. And I want to show you something that's very interesting. What does it mean when Jesus says, "Build your house upon the rock?" For those of you that might be builders, you may understand this completely well. But for others, it may not make a lot of sense. I want to read you this scripture. If you'll go with me to Matthew 7, 24. And I'm going to read through. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like the wise man, a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell... And the floods and the torrents came, and the winds blew, and it slammed against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, you'll be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods and the torrents came, And the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell great and complete with its fall. When Jesus had finished speaking these words on the mountain, the crowds were astonished and overwhelmed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority to teach entirely of his own volition and not as their scribes who relied on others to confirm their authority. I want to give you a few different I want to give you a few things that were very similar about these two guys who built their house. They actually had a few things in common. Number 1, they both build. So they're both builders. Number 2, they both heard Jesus teaching. Number 3, they both experienced the same set of circumstances in their life. But here's the difference. It's not about the one that's ignorant. The difference is about the one who ignores Jesus' teaching. I'm going to say that again. All of us are in this life together. We may not all experience the exact same things, but we all experience very similar circumstances of lots of Issues and problems and things go wrong. Death. People that we, you know, are trying to help that don't respond. Kids that may be lost. We have a lot of things in common that sometimes we don't stop to think about. And we all right now, and all throughout these past years, we've heard the teaching of the Lord. We've heard good preaching and teaching from this platform. From many different speakers. You've got umpteen opportunities to listen to good quality preachers online to bring the word. But it all boils down to this. You can hear and hear and hear. But what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Because it's all good and well to say, I just need the Word. Yeah, we need the Word. But it's not just about needing the Word. It's about listening to the Word and applying the Word. It's about doing something about that Word. And I would say that all of us fall short of really obeying and doing all that God has called us to do. Would you not say the same? We all need to tighten up our belts and recognize that some of us, our foundations are very shaky. Because we love to hear, we love to shout, we love to say that we were here in the church or we watched online. But it's what you're doing with that afterwards that counts. You can say all you want, I know Jesus, I know He lives, I know He died for my sins, I know He rose again and I know that I can have eternal life through Him. But if you don't accept Him, you are still a sinner. That's harsh to hear, but it's the truth. You can't keep saying that you want to live like God and still live like the devil. 
You can't listen to God's word when he says that we need to focus and, and get the word in ourselves. So that what comes out of our mouth, we know that is it a God thing or is it a, a devil thing or a worldly thing? We can only know that from what we've put inside. And I've come to challenge you today because I believe more than ever that our lives, we need to find out what are the structural problems in our foundation some of us in storms and in the things we go through we find ourselves very strong and able to make it there's other others of us that we recognize that we need to get stronger in the word that we need to dive in and we need to find out what does God say you see here's the question Romans 15 20 talks about ambition We should be ambitious to serve God, not ambition for personal advancement. Do you want more than anything to please Him and do His will? You see, we all have a story. We all have a story to tell. And I don't know about you, but I want my story to be this. That when the rains came and the winds blew, my house was built on you. I want to be able to say, I'm safe with you, God. I'm going to make it. I want to be able to say, I've got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I want to be able to say, not by my own strength, but I know that you're faithful in every storm. Why would he fail now? He won't. He's never failed. You may feel like he's failed, but he's never failed you. He's never let you down. So I'm going to challenge you today. We're going to play a song. And I'm going to ask you if you would to stand. I want you to think about your foundation today. I want you to be able to say to yourself, when the rains came and the winds blew, is my house really built on you? I want you to be able to walk out of here today, and those of you online, I want you to be able to say, I'm safe with you. I can trust you, God. It doesn't mean that you won't have tears. It doesn't mean that you won't be sad. It doesn't mean that you won't have times that you might be angry or upset. But here's what it does mean. That you come right back down to knowing this. You experience that for a little bit and then you put it behind you because you know that your foundation has to be in God. We all have to make choices when we face circumstances in life. We have to choose the right thing to do. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take you back to when I lost my dad. I can't tell you how many hours in the first beginning that I cried. And he passed away on my birthday. And I'll never forget that, but I will tell you this. I made a choice, I would not be bitter, that I would accept that what God knew was best, and even though you can have those times of tears and miss them, you will never stop missing them, and I don't even want to stop missing him, but I know he's having a lot better time than I am right now, and I know he's served well. but I will tell you this: we still have to pick ourselves up. And we still have to say, but God, my foundation is in you. When those storms come, God, I can trust you. And you may be going through some things right now that you are struggling with. But I want you to know that you can get that structure firm. 
And we're going to play this song. And I've asked them to play it with the words. If you've never heard this song, it's a powerful song. We've sang it here. It's Firm Foundation by Maverick City. I want you to listen to these words because it says exactly this. And I want you to repeat with me before we put it on. The rains came. The winds blew. But my house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it. Come on, some of you need to say that out loud. I'm going to make it. I've got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. Not held on my own strength. Faithful in every storm. Why would he fail now? He won't. Come on, just say that. He won't. He won't fail me. Play it. I want to encourage you, if you want to get out and worship, or if you need to come down here and kneel down and pray, we've got plenty of time to do that. But I want you to take this time right now. Get your foundation in order. Go ahead. on the rock and when a flood occurred the torrent burst against that